happening now. This is meeting number six of the closure group we call Data Recur. It is a dev group where some of the people behind the closure data libraries meet and collaborate. And today we'll have a very special one, a meeting with a presentation by, by Adrian Smith about connecting to native libraries, about the GPU, about high performance computing. And in a, in a few moments, Adrian will say more about it. And at the moment we are 12 people and uh, they will introduce themselves while we speak. Many, many wise and experienced people are here today. And I guess... Let's begin. My name is Adrian. I'm an open source closure developer. And uh, today I'll be talking about working with native libraries and the GPU. So the first thing I'd like to do is kind of set some context for um, kind of why I think this is an interesting thing to work on. So as an example, here I have um, a REPL open with, um, hopefully you can see this, with yama.clj, which is a wrapper for the yama.cpp project, which lets you run uh, LLMs locally on your own computer and in process. So the first thing I'll do is I'll run it and it will only run on the CPU. So we'll let it start up and ask it, uh, why does Closer have so many parentheses and see what it comes up with? And uh, so one of the things that's motivating um, looking at um, GPUs is because as you can see, it's uh, getting started here and uh, it's like crawling. So I'm just gonna cancel it and uh, now I'm going to ask the same question, except for I'm going to run it on the GPU. So hopefully the idea is that it, um, I think the GPU is probably actually being used by Zoom a little bit. So it's a little bit um, hampered. But as you can see, this is like way better. This is like so much more usable than the other version. Um, so uh, I think this demo kind of um, demonstrates a few reasons why um, what the context for this talk is. It's basically, one, we have access to yama.cpp, which is this uh, library. It's an open source library that was started when Yama got leaked, but now it works with all sorts of models like Phi and um, Gemma, or however you pronounce it, Yama, a dozen other models like BERT and uh, Yama or Java. Anyway, it gives you access to this library that's growing. Um, as well as it gives access to the GPU, which makes um, makes everything run a lot faster. And so um, having access to these native resources gives you access to the GPU, which speeds things up quite considerably. And just like on the JVM, you have access to um, a huge number of high quality Java libraries. Um, the JVM also has really good native access to libraries like Swift, Rust, C, C++, Objective-C, Zig, and a growing number of other system libraries. Um, and I think um, this is not usually the first place people look, but uh, especially with Project Panama and previously with uh, JNA, it's actually pretty usable. In some cases, now that I've gotten used to how, uh, how to do it, and there's better libraries um, for doing foreign function interface calls, uh, in many cases, I'd rather wrap a C library than a Java library because Java libraries do a lot of goofy stuff and C libraries are actually usually fairly functional and data oriented. And the other big difference um, with these FFI libraries is that they're in process and they're shared memory. So uh, you can do these things where you have like a server running on your computer doing like um, running an LLM and then you talk to that server. Uh, and the big difference is that there's no shared memory. So you basically have to serialize everything um, and it's just a lot less efficient. So I'm gonna try to do this. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm really curious to see what people are interested in um, or if people do have any interest in specific use cases for this. So. I would ask people to open up the chat and uh, just type in uh, what you might be interested in doing. You don't have to necessarily choose one of these, but maybe uh, maybe these will uh, give you 
you know, a starting point to think about. So yeah, if everybody could open up their chat and uh, just uh, say what they might be interested in, and maybe we can use uh, ChatGPT to collect all the answers. And I'll just kind of stare at everybody awkwardly while while we wait. Okay, cool. So we have uh, Daniel says scientific computing. Paula says training ML, fine tuning ML, and running ML locally. Running models, training models, fine tuning models from Rupert. Um, finite, uh, finite element analysis. That sounds cool. Okay, so uh, we've collected some of those. Faster graphics analytics, graph analytics. Okay. Um, yeah, feel free to keep adding more stuff if you think of it. Um, and feel free to just like, if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, and so now I'm going to do some quick demos. I recently did actually get um, WebGPU to be able to do 3D graphics, although this is like not very impressive, but uh, there's a lot of boilerplate that it requires to set this up. But um, so I'll just do some quick demos for these different pro projects. So GGML. Um, so GGML is interesting because it's a high level machine learning library written in C, uh, C++, but with a C interface. And what's cool about it is that um, it's got a lot of, it's a huge grassroots um, open source community around it. And they have examples for some really useful real world um, machine learning models. So there's like, uh, obviously there's Yama is probably the most popular one. There's Whisper for doing um, transcription of audio, Sam, Bert, Stable Diffusion, YOLO, um, and probably more, and it will probably continue to be expanded. So you can kind of um, see um, how it's being used. So, so here's a wrapper that I wrote in Clojure, and I'll just kind of demo. So what, um, what this demo shows is uh, basically if you, it will add two vectors element-wise. So if you have a thousand numbers in one vector and a thousand numbers in another vector, you'll get an output that's another thousand numbers of the two um, vectors being added. And um, here's kind of the meat of it. That's my graph. And so you can see, um, oh, I'm actually multiplying by the whole vector by minus one for some reason. Um, but anyway, uh, you can kind of see that there's these operations that GGML supports. And if I um, um, and basically you can, um, I mean, they have a, you know, lots of lots of operations that are supported that on um, basically um, vectors and uh, and matrices. And basically, you set up a graph that um, says what the operations are, and then GGML, you can uh, give it multiple backends, and so it can distribute that work across multiple GPUs, across the CPU, and um, I think the backends are uh, configurable, and you can add multiple, and it will kind of figure it out, or you can give it explicit, set explicit control about, like, run this part of the computation on the GPU or on the specific GPU. And the other really cool thing is that it's got um, implementations for NVIDIA chips. Uh, it runs on Metal, it runs on Vulkan, it does like OpenBlast. So it has multiple backends, it's cross-platform, it runs on Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. And um, so we'll just set it up really quick. Um, so it's running, so I've created um, two vectors of 10,000 elements, and we'll run it on the CPU. And that took 12 milliseconds. And so now let's run it on the GPU, and it's slower. Um, okay, well, 
that's not how it's supposed to work. Um, let's make the number bigger, and then hopefully we can see that the Okay, well, uh, that kind of ruins the demo, but um, in principle, I don't know what I did differently, but uh, usually the GPU runs faster. The more numbers you have, the more embarrassingly parallel operations you do, the faster it goes. Um, and then uh, the other GPU project that I've been looking at is um, WebGPU. So WebGPU sounds like it's like a web thing that runs in your browser, but it's actually also a, um, a native implementation. And there's a header file that um, defines the interface for native code. And there's actually two major implementations at the moment. There's um, Dawn, which is what Chrome is going to put, or what the Google team is going to put in Chrome. And then there's uh, GPU native, which is what Mozilla is working on, and that's what's going to go into Firefox. So there's two major implementations. They're cross-platform. They're it's relatively high level. It's uh, fairly easy to use. It also does graphics, and um, uh, it's cross-platform. And so um, that's one of the reasons I was interested in it is that I'm interested in a cross-platform object because I have a MacBook, and uh, I want to run it there. But I also want to be able to upgrade to. Uh, better GPUs and maybe run those in the cloud. But um, the um, right now, the interface um, for WebGPU uses uh, WGSL. You can also use other shaders. They have a, there's a project called Naga that can like translate shaders. And this is one of the kind of the pain points, I think, of uh, working with GPUs is that a lot of them um, have their own shading language. And so we're back to kind of like string templates. But um, this is in contrast to GGML, who kind of gives you the operations. And they uh, provide, they, they write all the shaders for you. So that's kind of one of the trade-offs that you can make. But anyway, this is like a really simple shader that will um, also add two numbers. And um, I wrote my own naive implementation that runs on the CPU. And then, um, this is what it looks like to run that same operation on the GPU. A lot of it is really just boilerplate. You need to um, set up the buffers where the data is stored. Um, you need to define the shader. And so most of the work is really done here where you just say compute the shader um, with these um, buffers attached. And so I think there's ways to, this could definitely be a lot more high level, but um, even still it's, um, relatively, there's not too much boilerplate. I tried to do this with Vulkan, and it was kind of a nightmare. Um, there's um, an example of using a compute shader with Vulkan, and it's like 500 lines of code to add two numbers, and uh, this is a lot um, more approachable. So anyway, um, just to run it with 65,000 numbers, Okay, so that took 20 milliseconds. And then we'll run it on the CPU. And that took about a second. So um, much, much faster here in this example. Um, and uh, I did want to kind of... Um, mentioned Klong, which is how these uh, projects are. So these projects are written in C and C++ or in Rust. And the uh, closure, the way I connected closure to these libraries is through a project that I've worked on called Klong. And what Klong does is um, you give it a bunch of header files, and it uses um, uh, libclang, which will parse the header files. And when you parse the header files, you get back this data structure. And so this is the actual data structure here, and it has three keys. It has the functions, the structs, and the enums. The enums are kind of not interesting. 
except for her. They give you the value, they give you the name, and it also importantly gives you the comment, which a lot of um, foreign function interface tools that are similar, like uh, JExtract and um, Java CPP, I don't think give you the comment, um, which is, uh, I think, super important for making, for automatically wrapping these libraries. And so um, it's kind of the same thing. So here's uh, here are all the functions and um, it gives you the arguments, the argument names, it gives you the doc string, it gives you the data types. And so when you call these functions, what you need to know is uh, the type it, uh, the types of the arguments and the types of the return value and um, the name of the function. And so basically, a lot of uh, previously this was all done manually. Uh, now with Klong, you give it the header files and it spits out the data structure. And then there's a um, separate process where you can turn this data structure into using macros to turn it into code. So you get um, high level functions like you see. So here where you see raw, this is really just a low level wrapper for. Um, for the native function in the shared library. And so it just exposes that to closure. And if there are doc strings, they automatically get added. And the code to do this is actually um, very minimal. So just to see what this looks like, there's some boilerplate. So basically what I do is um, there's this function called dump API where you can see it says parse API. So it parses it. That's the data structure that I just showed you. It writes it to an Eden file. Later on, I load it, which is just reading the Eden file. And the reason for this is that um, LLVM, and it also requires I and SM to generate bytecode. Um, this lets you generate the API ahead of time. And then at runtime, or if you distribute this library, you don't have to distribute these LLVM and I and SN with your library uh, because you can do this ahead of time. And so that also gives you, lets you uh, run this under native image. But basically this is, for most libraries, this is all the code that you need is you need to parse the header file, dump the API to a file, you load it, you call um, def API or def API lazy, which will, um, this is just a giant macro that, or I mean, the macro is like not that many lines of code, but it's basically just a macro that takes that, the datafied version of the API and turns it into a bunch of closure functions and uh, enum definitions. And so with relatively little amount of code, you can kind of um, get up and running and start calling functions in some shared library. And so that's, um, so I've been wrapping uh, more and more libraries. Um, this is not, this isn't even up to date, but um, I've done GraphViz, LibRetro, which lets you run NES and Super Nintendo emulators. There's GLFW, there's Yama, CLJ Media, which um, wraps FFmpeg and a few other ones that like, it's it's pretty easy to get started. So um, in some cases I'll try wrapping a library and then I'll start using it and be like, oh, I don't even like this library. So it's, it's way less committal to, um, have it automatically um, generate the library for you. And then I'll briefly um, go over this uh, option spreadsheet. So for FFI, I've listed out, um, so I've shared this link and I won't go into too much detail here, but um, Kind of the high level overview is that um, Panama is kind of the new thing, but it's only available in the latest versions of the JVM and it doesn't support uh, GraalVM native image. But I think all of these options are pretty good. I would uh, specifically call that um, dtype next as being a really great option. And then coffee if you want to start using Panama today. So, um, and the cool thing about this is that 
at least with the closure libraries, you can mix and match. So Clong generates the API, and then it also takes the API and generates um, closure functions. But you can, since those are two separate steps, you can mix and match. So if you want to use Java CPP to generate the interface, but you want to get the doc strings from the API, which it doesn't include, you can use Clong just for that piece. I think it would be really easy to have a generator for DTEP next. Um, I would have used it to begin with, but uh, at the time when I started Clong, it didn't have um, support for pass instructs by value, and now it does. So I think that would be a really obvious and um, useful integration to have. And um, I've uh, there's also a sheet for the different GPU options that I've looked at. And so there's, I mean, basically there's a lot of options that are tied to NVIDIA or there's Metal, which is Mac OS X only. I'm interested in cross-platform things. Um, Vulkan, I tried and it's just like, really the documentation is um, difficult and the usage is very low level. And so um, I just showed GGML by GPU. There's also, I think a very, good option in libpython clj where there's all this python code and you can just reuse that and then yonderthal which i haven't really tried because it doesn't run on my macbook but um that also looks like a really great option so um there's a bunch of question marks in the spreadsheet if somebody who knows more um they can i would love to get the feedback to fill in the question marks as well as look for more um more rows that differentiate the different options and um Cool, and so that's kind of an overview of um, what I, you know, Closure Meets Metal is about. And I'd love to open it up to discussion from here or answer any questions. And here are some questions that I'm interested in. So you don't, have, if you have a, any particular thoughts on these, I would love to get your, um, get the experience report. So um, there's, uh, so one thing that I'd be interested in is just for my own learning is like implementing a model, but the only way I've seen to implement a model is basically you read somebody else who implemented it in Python or C++ and that's like kind of cumbersome or you read an academic paper. I don't know if there's like a better way to do that. So if somebody has thoughts on that, I would love to hear. Um, I know people who are applying these uh, machine learning or real world use cases using Clojure, so I'd love to hear about that. And then um, I would also like to see how um, existing libraries like DType Next could be extended to use the GPU. And uh, if anybody has any thoughts on libraries that they use or work on that um, could uh, be, that are extensible and could have GPU integration. So that's, uh, that's kind of all I have prepared. I'm happy to answer questions or go into the details on any of these things, but I'd like to open it up the discussion. Beautiful. So much to talk about now. Yeah, so just a reminder for everybody. First time you talk, please say something about your, yourself. You know, I'm Danielle, I do statistics and geography or maybe even more like one or two sentences, even if you know that Adrian knows you. And yeah, so that's the part where we wish to hear the voices. And yeah, we have lots of time to talk. Any thoughts, any questions, comments? I think I can start, um, start us off. So this is uh, Chris Nurberger. Can everybody hear me? Is my audio working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think there's, there's two, at least two separate things that we're looking at here. The one thing is, uh, binding to native code and Klong is a distinct step forward. I didn't know about it, but it, it is a missing piece for sure. Um, that's really nice that you exported the function signatures just like that. That's very easy to create a dynamic straight to D type next kind of D type next FFI implementation type thing from that. So that's really nice. And I also think that on a more abstract sense, 
probably one thing I have, I used Java CPP years ago when I wrote Cortex, which was a deep learning framework in Clojure. And I found that Java CPP actually bound too tightly to the APIs. And so a good example was we we built a model for doing some satellite, satellite imagery work. And when we went to run it on the customer's machines, they had a slightly different CUDA driver than what we were running with. And that caused um, the whole, the, the model just not to run. And it's because Java CPP was binding to a lot of functions that we weren't actually using and weren't necessary for what we were doing. And so I thought about that and coming from NVIDIA, I was very careful to use exactly the functions I needed and nothing more. And then I got kind of defeated and a C version of what I would have done, which would have been way less work in a lot of ways would have worked better because it was more robust because it didn't bind to every CUDA thing. And in order to upgrade that, we had to figure out which exact CUDA version they were running on their cloud machines that they were launching in, you know, these instances and in like secure data houses and such. So long story short, dynamically binding to the symbols uh, for me makes your code, you, you have the option that you could potentially have software that can run on multiple versions of the hardware running underneath you or multiple versions of the library by detecting the library instance and booting up the interface that matches the library instance and just not having features available when possible. So there's a robustness issue. And obviously that robustness issue can go both ways, but I really appreciate more dynamic approaches to binding to native libraries when I can get them. Um, so I, I really like that. But the other thing is, as far as Llama goes, um, something along this line of, of stuff is um, uh, TVM, which is something I've talked about in the past, and there, I've, I've had TVM bindings, rough ones forever, but TVM's API changes a lot, so I don't keep the bindings up to date, it's just too much work. But in that system, and there's a there's a library, TVM CLJ, that's on TechAssense thing, but it, in that system, you kind of create a graph of computations, and then you can run it on any backend that you want, kind of similar to Llama, but I think a lot more um, low level. And then there are LLM implementations for TVM. So there's a big LLM implementation that uh, is built on top of TVM. And my guess is that if you want inference speed, especially on odd hardware, the TVM approach is going to win, especially inference at the edge type things. I don't know how big that is for specifically a lot of the LLM models because they're too big to run on the edge, but TVM really shines when you start running inference at the edge in an IoT environment or something like that. So uh, please, I, I would... maybe I'll stop you for a moment. Could you maybe mm -hmm. say a little more about what TVM is? We have time for this and it's kind of important, I think. So... Yeah. So let's go. Yeah. Open deep learning compiler stack. Thank you for going to the web page because I, I think this is key. It, it basically, um, you can implement a processing graph, you know, A plus B over C matrix multiplied by something else. And then TVM can look at the whole graph and optimize the whole graph at once. And it's something, it's based off like a large set of research. It's based off the Halide compiler way back in the day. There's a whole theory of optimization behind it that I've talked about in the past. And so if you go to TVM CLJ's um, website, uh, if you want to just Google search for that really quick. Yeah. So this, uh, there's somewhere in here where I say, here's the, um, the theory behind it. That theory contains a lot of information. And the, and the best thing is the thesis of for Halide. I think for me, that really opened up a lot of like thoughts about how to optimize any processing system, but especially these sorts of complex processing systems. Um, and so there's a good, yeah. Um, So I, I tested it. I tested like how fast can I get image resize to be and various other things. And I compared it against uh, what's the big image library that everybody likes to use. I forget the name of it. Um, but anyway, and, and I could with work and massaging, I could end up beating the image library by a considerable amount, even though it was hand optimized by Intel engineers at one point. So it really is a neat system. It's a whole different way of looking at how to optimize software. And I think it's worthy of talking about. It. But there is an LLM implementation that's based on TBM. That's pretty much everything 
I have to say for now. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> I did just want to quickly mention that um, one of the big, I mean, big benefits of turning, <coughs> excuse me, your API into data, excuse me, is that um, as he was saying that sometimes you only want part of the API or you want to do special things with it or you want to tweak it depending on the platform. And I've been able to do all of those things with Clog where you get the API and you're just like, okay, I only want all of the symbols that start with GGML or I want to uh, take all the functions that start with create and I want to do something special for their generation or I want to take you know, some subset of functions and tweak um, what data they expect depending on the platform. And uh, also in some cases, I don't automatically generate specific functions and I write my own unique wrapper for specific functions. And so having your API data lets you do all of those things, um, which is really nice and you can do it programmatically, which, uh, you know, as a Lisp, that's, uh, it feels very natural. Well, here's a concrete thing that just happened with DuckDB and people like DuckDB a lot. And DuckDB's D types FFI bindings allow you to run DuckDB with JNA or with Panama. But I never noticed any speed increase because I use direct linking with JNA. And so uh, concretely, I just don't notice any speed increase with Panama. And it seems like kind of a pain in the butt for no reason, but it does work. But in any case, um, uh, they changed the order of enumerations between version 10.1. 10 and 10.1, and then they changed it back for 10.2. So in a world where you're like releasing software to multiple people, you may very well have to support all three of those versions in a smart way. And like having your API's data, as you say, you could have small data sets saved out that contain maybe just the differences between them. And so you could just bind to the least number of functions you needed to to query a version number. And then once you got a version number, you could bind to the symbols that were appropriate. Um, so just, I really do agree. I think that's a good point. Uh, having more of the APIs as data, especially clean data that's human readable, which the Eden that you showed was beautiful. Like I, I agree completely. That helps a lot. If that had been there, quite a few projects that I've done would have taken a lot less time. So I'd be particularly interested in hearing uh, Dragon opinion if he's, here or I know Paul has been doing some really cool work recently, so uh, I'd love to hear from both of them and everybody else as well. But uh... hello, hello, Dragon is here. Do you hear me? Yeah, wonderful to hear you, Dragon. Yeah, hello. So so far, I don't have anything to add because. A lot of uh, stuff has been mentioned here, and uh, it's a great exploration. So uh, I guess uh, now it's just the thing that uh, these uh, things have to be tried on some uh, practical examples. So that will give everyone the answers that they're looking for, depending on uh, what they need. So the possibilities are, are boundless, but uh, the thing is that uh, different people uh, need different uh, things and uh, have different problems. Uh, and sometimes uh, these problems are complex, sometimes not so complex. Uh, so I guess that uh, every problem has its uh, simpler and not so simple ways of solving it. So I don't have anything to add so far. And uh, I know Rupert has also um, been doing some interesting work. He's given some really um, helpful feedback in, um, in fact, getting started with um, Yama.cpp. He was, uh, if you're in the Clojure LLM, Clojure and Slack channel, I highly recommend it. And he's been really helpful there. So if he has any input, as well as Paula, um, or anybody else, we'd love to 
Yeah, hi guys, I'm Rupert here. Um, I am a, I guess I'm a CTO at a small startup in London. Uh, I've been doing Clojure for about 10 years, uh, mostly within the sort of machine learning uh, area. Um, thanks for the presentation, Adrian, it's really good. And I think thanks for the work on these, um, you know, on these libraries. I think they're really interesting in terms of opening up what you can do in Clojure because, you know, you've got a lot of libraries in Clojure, but there's a lot of other uh, communities out there building in other programming languages and just being able to access what others are doing, uh, I think is really is really good because I think you can just sort of continue to work in a high level language like Clojure that you're happy to work in, and then you can access these extra uh, functionality from there. Um, I guess to report back on my experience with um, Llama CLJ, which is your wrapper around uh, the Llama project. I guess, which also uses Klong in the background. Um, I think it was really interesting in that uh, it lets you have much, um, much sort of tighter um, access to the Llama, um, you know, LLM model. And so you can do things like access all the log probs uh, on every single token. And if you're using something like an API, you know, you over REST, you don't really typically want to receive 30,000 or even you know, 60,000 uh, log probs for every single token that you output over a JSON format. Whereas in memory, that's much, much faster. So I think it's very interesting for accessing that data as the model's running, be able to access those. Um, and even for, um, I guess, manipulating uh, the uh, decision of which tokens are taken. So for example, you can apply your own logic and say, uh, even though this token may have a higher probability, I'm forcing you or constraining you uh, to, take, to accept this token instead. So um, I think it's really interesting from that point of view. I think it's great in terms of, um, I can see there being a direction of LLMs just being more and more integrated into software that we build, uh, particularly sort of small LLMs, maybe sort of the 3 billion parameter mark. Um, and so um, I think programming languages which have zero access to these will, will struggle more than uh, programming languages uh, that have access. And I think this gives us a path into using those models um, over time, which has been really helpful. Uh, I, I guess maybe my questions probably for you today are, um, I guess one thing I'd be interested in is people often think I've got a GPU and it's an untapped resource and I've got maybe some closure code, which are doing maps and filters and maybe some manipulation. How can someone start to think about taking something which was a P, maybe they're using PMAP, they're like, oh, I'm paralyzing this across um, a CPU. How can they maybe move towards pushing some of that workload? What's the first step towards pushing that workload onto, onto a GPU? Um, so yeah, I think kind of the rule of thumb that I saw is that for embarrassingly parallel work, which a lot of like uh, vector and linear algebra stuff is, um, is that it's like 10 to 20 times faster. It could be much more or much less. And kind of the um, way to think about it is the GPU runs each step slower, but it can run a bunch of stuff in parallel. And the uh, trade-off is that, um, so if you have a bunch of serial steps, it's not gonna be much faster, but if you can do a lot of stuff in parallel, it can be much faster. And then there's this penalty between, you have something in memory on the CPU, and if you wanna run on the GPU, you gotta transfer to the GPU, and if you want the answer, you need to transfer it back. And there's um, there's a noticeable penalty there, it's not huge, but it does mean that like you need bigger data sets to get that, to actually win. Um, and the other thing to say about that is you can transfer data to the C, uh, GPU, tell it to do a bunch of operations like add, multiply, subtract, combine, uh, reduce, and um, do a bunch of stuff all on the GPU and then wait to transfer it back at the end. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I was kind of surprised to find out is that, um, so when you think of like transducers like map, is it obviously... Uh, embarrassingly parallel thing because you just apply a function to each element. 
you can also do reductions and that can also be sped up. So if you want to do like a histogram, like you have 10,000 numbers and you want to bucket them into 20 different buckets, that can also be sped up. Um, sorting. Uh, so like basically, if you think of like MapReduce, um, the map can all be done in parallel. And then the reductions, you kind of have a log logarithmic number of steps where you like run, um, you know, if you have like a hundred items, you have like, you go two by two and combine, and then you have 50 items and you go two by two and combine. And so you have like log base two number of steps and a lot of stuff is being done in parallel. So you can also, in some cases, speed up something that's, um, that's not just a map. And you can also do like filters and stuff. So um, I am still kind of figuring out, um, I, I think it's still an open question as to um, what the best approach is. Like you can write your own shaders and that kind of gives you more access. And you can also go kind of the way the GML goes, which is you have operations and you create a graph of computations and you create this pipeline and then you hand that to the GPU. And I think both of those are interesting. I see Chris uh, might have some thoughts. Yeah, I do have a lot of thoughts exactly on that. Um, so that's actually the problem I started with about 10 years ago. Well, I started thinking about was like, how do you get closure, the general closure person to write code that's more amenable to the GPU? And where I landed with that is first get them to write code that's more amenable to the CPU. And where I landed with that was TMD. Um, so that gets you uh, uh, the technical data sets. Is, sorry. TMD is uh, the data processing library, technical data set data processing. It's just a column major data processing library like Pandas or whatever else. So in one sense, if you're, oh, right. I don't know how much time I have left. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, <laughs> so in one sense, um, in one sense, I think that um, you first get them to write code that's better for the uh, for the CPU. And uh, there's one one prong of that is just use TMD uh, when you're mapping and filtering over a bunch of sequences of maps. A less strict prong of that are some of the primitives that are in ham fisted, which is the optimized closure library that I wrote for doing high performance computations. Um, on the CPU and like a primitive there is group by reduce where it does a reduction during the group by. So the histogram problem is a good example of that. I have many examples of fast histograms and that was part of my like high performance closure talk that I gave, I don't know, two years ago. Um, but I, I, I think it's an interesting problem to look at closure when people write it in its naive form and then say, how do we make this fast? Um, where I've landed with that after having thought about it with a lot is you get them to, you have to get them to structure the problem a little differently in most cases, um, if you really want good performance. But, and that means, you know, that's where TMD came from. That's where lots of the stuff I've worked on for a long time came from. So I think it's interesting, Rupert, that you're just, you're, you're thinking about that too. And I'm just telling you where I got to after years of thinking about it. <clears throat> um, and with that, I think I, I have to go take care of my kids, guys. I really like this conversation. Um, so I will, I'll be interested in jumping into the recording at this point. Cool. Yeah. I wonder it'd be interesting. Um, obviously I, I guess, uh, TMD is probably going down the route of a, a library. I wonder if there's a route where we kind of just take closure code and then transform it, um, directly, you know, take it as a data structure, transform it so that the user can almost uh, right closure the way they would normally and then have it have it move to the GPU from there. Good. Don't know if that'd be possible. Right. I don't know if that's too too unlikely. Yeah, I mean I think I you can do something. Yeah. Is it John? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to I would definitely second Chris's point about doing this on the CPU first. And the other thing that I would say, so also in conjunction with um, his suggestion about things like TMD, 
is I would also highly recommend the the uh, uncomplicate stuff that Dragon has done, especially to start with things like uh, the Neanderthal, because which is basically glass lapex, and because it it definitely will change the way you think about a lot of these iterative kinds of techniques that you would use to solve problems that have a lot of uh, multiple computations, especially those that can be done in parallel, uh, that people would in closure land be using map reduce or for loops or whatever, um, which doesn't really lend itself directly to any kind of parallelization. I mean, you can do things like folding or PMAP or something like that, but that stuff is way slower. And um, and, and it doesn't, and it, and it still doesn't really get you thinking along the lines of how matrix operations work, which are the essential parallel kind of constructs that you're going to use to speed all this stuff up. And then the nice thing there is, is that in general, you can just directly move this stuff to the, to the GPU. Uh, yeah, I will say that um, I haven't been able to really use the um, and complicate stuff yet, but I've like looked at the docs and the API, and I think if the you're thinking about how to like how can you write this with closure code, um, from what I can tell, the um, the way it's set up is like very closure friendly, and it's very like um, yeah, it, that's like the API that um, it uses seems like it might be a good model. Um, and I don't know how easy it would be to um, add another backend to Neanderthal, like web GPU that would let it run on Max or write a Mac specific one would be cool if somebody would do that. Um, but I don't know how hard that would be, but that may be a, a cool way to do it. Yeah, I think Dragon would probably be the guy that really uh, speak to that and I would, I would certainly uh, try to support any effort in that along those lines. Hello. Um, yes. yes. Here. Speak up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, I gotta go uh, in a few minutes, but I just wanted to uh, give a a few a few information here. So uh, one was the question. Uh, Oh, it looks like you just got muted. Uh, so we can't, if Dragon, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Oh, Hello. Seems, oh <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, it seems like uh, you, you came back for just a moment and now you're, seems to have muted again. Oh, okay, oh. can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so uh, to, to repeat, uh, so uh, the question was, uh, would it be possible to add uh, different backends to Neanderthal, uh, most uh, most importantly to support uh, Mac OS uh, on uh, M architecture? And yes, uh, when I designed Neanderthal and other libraries, uh, I took a great uh, a great care to to uh, create it in a modular fashion so uh, so uh, different uh, backends could be relatively easily plugged in so, uh, that's that's how i supported uh, for the same code at the same time uh, cpu and intel and um, nvidia cuda and opencl etc so about mac os uh, the biggest ob obstacle now is that i don't have a, a mac hardware uh, because uh, I had one really old Intel-based Mac, but it doesn't help with this new situation. And the other thing is that, of course, uh, that code has to be written. So uh, it is not trivial. It is not uh, impossible, but uh, a lot of work has to be done. Uh, and uh, I uh, applied for closures together 
the last uh, time uh, to to uh, get a project to acquire the, a Macintosh uh, computer and to explore this stuff to see uh, how difficult and what uh, what work uh, should be done uh, to create a backend for Neanderthal and other libraries. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't get it, but uh, it is this uh, application is valid for two rounds. So, finger crossed, uh, they will uh, they will uh, choose it uh, as one of the projects in some of the next rounds. So, if if that happens, I will acquire a uh, a Macintosh computer and explore uh, what needs to be done and. Uh, Hopefully, in some of the next period and next rounds, uh, I could start uh, filling in the pieces. So, uh, a library such as Closure CUDA, which is uh, a library for directly programming CUDA in Closure. So, I probably could create something equivalent for Macintosh for whatever technology they use now. Maybe it's metal, but maybe they added something else. And uh, of course, for Neanderthal, I would have to explore uh, how to uh, how to integrate uh, various uh, linear algebra operations uh, on NVIDIA. But I, I guess that uh, there is support for most of them uh, provided by Apple. So it only would be a matter of uh, going one by one and integrating it. And... Uh, for deep learning, I'm not sure they they had some libraries. They deprecated them. They added some some others. So the next step would be for deep learning. But I think uh, the most uh, immediate stuff would be uh, a library for accessing GPU directly and a library for accessing uh, linear algebra op uh, uh, operations that would be created directly in Neanderthal, and then. Uh, the users could uh, just write a general code as today and uh, on Macintosh it would be executed on, on Mac hardware and that would be it. So no no additional uh, effort from the users would be required. Um, Thanks. I should jump in. Um, I've been wanting to use Neanderthal. Um, just a month ago I had to give my daughter a um, uh, the only Intel-based machine I had left. Uh, so I'm stuck entirely on Mac and can't use Neanderthal at all. Um, one of the issues with that is that when you load up Core, it uh, has um, built in as a, um, into the requires um, the MK, MKL libraries for, uh, from Intel, and that won't load on, on a Mac at all. So the, um, Neanderthal will need some reconfiguration from core just to only load certain things um, depending on the environment that you're in. So if you're not on an Intel CPU, there are certain namespaces which you can't bring in. Um, but going through and looking at the structure of it all, um, in particular, I was focused on CUDA. Uh, I looked at how that might be re-implemented on Metal. Um, and so I have, um, over three quarters of that done right now um, with the plan of integrating that in, into Neanderthal. Um, I've taken all the vector operations, uh, so the vector operations which uh, Dragon's done in uh, for CUDA and essentially transliterated them over into Metal. Um, the syntax is a little different. The um, the, the there's annotations which come through with the uh, attributes. You work with you know some of the uh, parameters that Metal passes through are a bit different to how CUDA manages it. Um, and unfortunately, CUDA has a whole lot of functions, um, most of which are are actually in um, uh, POSIX. Um, but a few go beyond there, um, like basic math functions around like error function and inverse error function, complementary um, error function and complementary inverse error function and things like that, which are all in, um, some of them are in POSIX, some of them uh, NVIDIA has gone beyond. 
Um, a lot of these things are not uh, available in metal, uh, but I've managed to track down Taylor series expansions for all of those. And so I've got those implemented in my shaders as well. Um, and uh, at the moment, the whole thing's really just going from uh, a Java class. I'm using JNI, not JNA, um, to go through to um, everything that I've done in the shaders. Uh, but I've still got to build it out a little further. Um, and uh, most of it is around um, the vectors and matrices, but I don't have a linear algebra things done yet. So for instance, I, um, I definitely want to get um, matrix multiplication in because that's such a fundamental part of ML. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build it out and I'm trying to build it as a relatively isolated layer hidden behind um, a Java class so that I can hook it into the, that bottom layer of, um, of Neanderthal. Um, and I did that because I saw that Dragon didn't have access to Mac hardware, and I do, and I really want this for neural networks. <laughs> um, but the other thing is that, like, everyone has been saying, oh, we need to do this in metal. I was two weeks into this before um, wondering how do I access the neural um, processing unit in an M2 or an M1? And it turns out that Apple has a completely different API uh, for doing this. It's um, uh, the uh, Core ML API. And Core ML, it turns out, um, wraps Accelerate and Metal and various things. And it does dispatch um, to Metal or the neural processing units. Um, uh, within it. And so even though I'm doing all of this for metal, like, as I said, almost like a transliteration of the, the CUDA work that Dragon's done, uh, I think, um, you know, once I'm done or get it to a stopping point, I might just switch over and try to re-implement or expose a lot of this functionality uh, from Core ML um, so that, you know, I can use it from Closure. But, you know, I really appreciate somebody who knows some of these things like Dragon uh, to have a look at what I've got working so far and to offer direction on it. Um, you know, some of this has been naive. I've been coming at it from uh, a relatively naive viewpoint. Um, so, yeah, I'd appreciate feedback. Uh, hello, Dragon here. Do you hear me? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paula, uh, for doing uh, this uh, exploration. Okay, I can just say just continue and we hope that uh, something useful will come out of it. Uh, but just uh, quick information about uh, Neanderthal core. Uh, Neanderthal core is completely uh, independent independent on the, the, on the backend. So uh, MKL is not loaded by core, but it's loaded by native. Uh, and it's only a default engine in native. So the complete MKL engine is completely separated from ev everything else and from CUDA engine and et cetera. Uh, so basically uh, in, uh, in the native name space, uh, MKL is loaded uh, because it's the only CPU implementation right now. Uh, but when I create uh, supposedly another uh, CPU implementation, for example, for Macintosh uh, using some uh, Mac, Apple provided API or, or whatever, uh, that would be a, a different backend. And then in a native, uh, I would uh, implement uh, uh, automatic uh, setup of uh, the engine uh, depending on which computer it uh, or, or which hardware or operating system is recognized. So uh, uh, MKL is not baked in in, in anything uh, general and uh, any different engine can be uh, plugged in where uh, MKL is uh, now. Okay, yeah, um, I had quite a lot of native. Um, I'm just looking at it right now. I apologize for saying it was in core.
so yeah, one question I have is, so I've been like looking at GPU options that I could run on my Mac and like I had almost given up and now it seems like there's maybe multiple options, but uh, I hadn't actually thought past like, okay, now what do you do with, um, now that you can access the GPU, like what do you do with it? So I see there's a few people that are like training models, uh, finding tuning. Um, uh, if anybody has an experience port where they can, I know that some of those things sort of work, you can't always talk about those things, but if you can share a little bit about that process, it's, uh, uh, I would be interested to hear. So um, my name is Adrian Medina. Um, I work in cybersecurity, <clears throat> interested in semantic web. Um, I love everything that you're doing. Um, I really like Clong. I think that there's a lot of applications um, to it for reverse engineering. Um, Ghidra is a, is a software reverse engineering platform that is open source and works in Java. Um, might be interesting to investigate. And um, Practically speaking, I think GPUs are very useful for graph analytics. So for example, PageRank, if you want to do really, really fast searches over things, you can do them a lot faster with GPUs. Um, we just don't have the, the software we need to um, make that easy yet. So I'm glad to see these kind of initiatives uh, birth in closure. I guess, Adrian, you asked about uh, usage reports around machine learning. So I guess my usage is mostly around, um, I guess, automation. And I just think there's a, a lot of opportunities to automate tasks that we would normally have written software for perhaps in the past, or maybe it was too complex to write software for, or maybe it would be too brittle to write software for. And now you can kind of use software um, I guess the term we often use now is agents that we're building. And that's, um, they're pretty much like software programs agents, but uh, they have a, a machine learning component to them uh, for getting work done. So I think that's the usage there. And I just think that there is even, even the way that we write software now, you know, writing closure code uh, can be helped with, I guess, with uh, machine learning. And so it sort of feels very natural that as we're all programmers, we want to, um, understand this thing that is kind of impacting the way that we, I guess, will produce code going forward in the future increasingly. So um, I think it's interesting from that, that point of view too. So I'll be, um, there's been a lot of links in the chat and I'll be adding them to the spreadsheet that I added earlier. Um, the graph analytics sounds really cool. I um, previously looked at a thing called Cosmos, which does, um, does force directed layout of graphs. So, but if you have any, um, that's in JavaScript, but it also, I think it runs in it and it runs on the GPU and it can, it can really work on really large graphs, but I would love to be able to do that from closure. But if you have any links to um, libraries, even in other languages that kind of do some of the stuff, maybe those could be inspiration for, um, for closure. So I'd love to, if you have any resources for that, I can add those to the spreadsheet. Maybe Adrian Medina, it makes sense to comment about uh, CUDF and the, the tools you use for that. Oh yeah, so I recently discovered that there's a Java binding for um, a CUDA uh, library called CUDF, which is a data frame um, library basically like you have a CSV or other input and do traditional kind of um, analysis on it, but really, really fast. And um, I was surprised that the Java library worked out of the box with CUDA um, with the graphics card um, and was super, super optimized. Um, and uh, so, I don't have too much more to say about that, but I think that it's an interesting, if you have a CUDA graphics card, check out CUDF Java, it's open source. Um, 
in the uh, in their GitHub. And it's also on Maven, so you can just add it to your depths and play with it. Um, oh yeah, one other question that I was interested in, if people have figured it out is, um, so I figured out how to package these libraries into jars so you can just like include a um, depths um, coordinate and it will like download all the dependencies and that seems to work on Mac OS X and you don't have to like do anything special. And uh, I think that can in principle work on Windows. For Linux with CUDA, I have not been able to figure out if there's like some sane way to like to provide a jar that works with CUDA with the native libraries included without you having to like go and yeah. um, check out the CUDF Java. They have like a whole build automation that packages the jar with the native. So also another resource that might be interesting for you is LWJGL3, the lightweight Java game library has um, its, its own um, sort of set of bindings for how to deal with native memory for games, but it, it has a lot of uh, C libraries uh, that are generated through their uh, through their interface, and it's a uh, interesting stuff there. Yeah, I'm excited to play with Klong. I didn't know this existed. The documentation, uh, there, I mean, there's just tons of examples, but there's not a whole lot of documentation. Maybe now that I've presented on it, I will update the documentation a bit. But um, there's also a, a Klong channel in uh, the Clojure in Slack. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask there because, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces between JNA and um, dealing with C code. And also um, there's... Um, having wrapped a bunch of these libraries, I've kind of figured out some of the edge cases, like how do you deal with callbacks? How do you deal with memory management? And so if you have any questions about those or running into any problems, um, uh, don't hesitate to just ask because it's easy to bang your head against the wall for quite a while. Oh, I like how you could datafy the, the headers. That's cool. Yeah, actually in uh, LWJGL, they have a, a live clang binding if you want to check that out if that could erase some work you have to already do um yeah i mean i think i mean there are several generators like jextract and java cpp and uh they just produce these like weird goofy java libraries and like um I really oh yeah like i know you're talking about yeah and then some of those are just like really cumbersome to use and then you have to do a lot of java interrupt whereas this lets me i i like having the control and being able to get the data and um, produce my own uh, bindings programmatically. And like one of the cooler things that I think about the project is that, um, so uh, Klong uses libclang and the AP for, API for that is generated by um, Klong itself. And so to parse the oh. header files for Klong, it uses Klong. And the very first version of that was written in Python where I wrote the Python to generate the API. Then I wrote a generator for the API and then I then switched over to the clock or the closure generated API to interface with um, libclang. And so now it's all, uh, now the next version of clong is generated with the previous version of clong, although the libclang is pretty stable. So that doesn't typically happen. It's very cool. I also see the potential uh, not to go on about clong but um, to generate sort of allow lists for the kind of symbols if you are binding to native libraries in like a business environment and you don't want to necessarily give um, the ability to just, hey, bind any native, you know, load native libraries in your Java program and then call them. Um, you could actually use this potentially to generate an allow list of the symbols and then verify that at runtime. And so you could kind of have your cake and eat it too, I think, with this kind of uh, technology. Yeah, I mean, there's um, several examples of the using the Datafied API and manipulating it programmatically uh, based off the platform, based off the symbols that you want. Um, and 
for several other use cases where you kind of manip um, yeah, manipulate the API itself as data before generating all the closure code that lets you interact with it. Should we maybe talk a little bit about memory, about the way we handle memory without the garbage collector, which is something that closure people are not so used to, right? I think uh, Neanderthal offers a certain practice that it tries to teach us about, you know, caring about memory, reusing memory without freeing everything immediately. And maybe Adrian, you have some practices you have kind of created in your libraries about how, how you encourage the user to care about memory. Well, um, so memory is one of these things that you have to think about when you're dealing with native libraries. And if you get it wrong, in some cases it will crash the JVM, which is really annoying for if you like REPL driven development because then you have to restart the REPL. Um, but I think it can seem intimidating, but I, I wanna, um, so I don't wanna make it seem like it's uh, free, but it's not, I don't think as bad as it sounds. So there's um, kind of two, ways to think about it that I think are helpful. So the first is that um, in Java 9, they have a, um, there's Java cleaners, which basically then turns it back into memory, memory uh, garbage collection problem. So basically what you do is you give it the reference and you say, when, um, when there's no more references to it, run this cleanup function. And so that corresponds to a lot of native code where you basically, where basically that's the practice where you either, um, when you're done, when you um, no longer need it, it's typically called ownership, but when you no longer need it, you either call a um, release function, which re releases the memory, or you um, decrement some um, mem um, shared pointer, like um, reference counting mechanism. And so you can basically tell the cleaner to handle it for you. And so as long as you set it up where, I mean, typically what I do is I have the raw interface, which is like, just lets me call the native code. And then I build a high level interface. And in the high level interface, I try to take care of all these things for you. And then if you use a high level interface, it's hopefully just like interacting with a regular closure library. And so in that high level interface, I take care of like, whenever I give a pointer to somebody, I um, wrap it in a cleaner. And I typically also implement the auto close interface, which just lets you call close on it. So if you want to, um, if you want to release the resources um, you, at a specific time and you don't want to wait for the garbage collector to do it, um, you can close it specifically and explicitly when it makes sense. And then, um, so that the first thing is like, a lot of times you can just let Cleaner do all the work for you. And then the second way to think about it is that um, memory is just like another resource. So if you've written code that has like network connections, database connections, or sort of file system, um, or other resources, in a lot of cases, you can also reuse those same um, techniques to deal with memory. And so in some cases, you already know and have experience with the tools you need to manage memory because it's just the same as um, deal with any other resource. So if Java Cleaner can't deal the do all the work for you, you can um, treat it like uh, one of these other shared resources like file handles and network connections. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, we now have 10 minutes to the official time. I'm proposing that in a few moments we'll stop the recording just because then people are more free you know, to say more sometimes. And so maybe if anybody wishes to say something before we stop the recording, and then maybe Adrian will conclude this part, will be nice. And, and then we'll stop and for a few of us, we'll just keep chat, chatting. Um, yeah, so any comment by anybody except for Adrian before Adrian concludes this part? Maybe I'll just say that uh, at Cycloge for, you know, for statistical computing and all that, we are looking to wrap some C libraries and probably we will try to use Clonk for this. And then if anybody 
of our listeners wishes to get involved in helping out, writing some closer wrapper for a C library, then let us talk about it and collaborate. And yeah, if there and aren't any comments, then maybe Adrian would like to conclude the recorded part. Yeah, so um, two things I kind of forgot to mention that I wanted to mention on the recording is that uh, I am interested in seeing if there's some way to implement some interfaces for D-Type Next because it already has a wide range of ways to deal with um, native memory and uh, native data. So if there's some way to um, kind of extend D-Type Next to say like, okay, well, um, Computer history on the GPU. That would be, I think, really nice. Um, and then the other thing is that, like, one of the pains that I'm still figuring out, I think, for uh, is how to distribute native resources. And on Mac OS X, it's not so bad. Um, you can just put it in a jar. Uh, with Linux, I think it kind of depends. In some cases, uh, it works better than others. Um, but if anybody has any questions about those, I'm happy to like share what I've tried, or if anybody comes up with a uh, clever solution to that, um, I would love to hear it. The The hardest, typically a lot of these libraries, you can get just one shared library that does everything. The really hard part is like, um, I was recently, for the 3D stuff, I was wrapping Manif uh, CLJ Manifold, which I think was the previous Closure is Together project. And it depends on free type, which depends on the ping. And so you get this like, um, you have kind of a dependency tree of shared libraries, and that's still pretty a lot harder. But um, I've done some work there, and happy to share what I've done. If other people come up with stuff, that would be great. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff that's just been happening recently, and I'm excited to see what people do. So that's uh, I think that's that's everything. Beautiful. So we'll now say goodbye to our listeners and see you on the next times. Then a few of us will stay longer and chat. <laughs>